Welcome to Series 53, everyone. We have a phenomenal game that we are covering this series, Nova by Spencer Campbell, a twice any nominated RPG, and it is just so good. Uh, so we can't wait to get to character creation for that. So we actually don't have any real announcements right now for this episode. Just check back with us in the call to action to hear about our latest Patreon offerings. Uh, some Patreon shoutouts, and more of just me since Amelia is not feeling well for this cold open recording. Enjoy the show, everyone. Welcome to Character Creation Cast, a show where we discuss and create characters, the best part of role-playing games, with guests using their favorite systems. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan, and this episode, my co-host Amelia and I are thrilled to welcome Spencer Campbell, indie groundbreaker, award winner, and creator of the game we are covering this month, Nova. Welcome to Character Creation Cast. We are really excited you're here. I am particularly super excited. I know mm -hmm. we've wanted to cover this game for a while. I think it's been on our list. I love it. So I'm I'm super excited. Ooh. Ooh. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm also very, very excited. I love your show. I absolutely love your show. Oh, good. Um, well, I love your games, so... This worked out perfectly. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> you got games in my show. You got shows, you got in, shows my games. in my games. <laughs> I was first introduced to this show um, when you did your Spire episode a ways mm -hmm. back because mm -hmm. I'm obsessed with Spire. I think it's... God, it's such a good game. It's so good. The system is good. All of it is, all of it is very good. And so I was like desperately trying to find Aspire content online to just like put more into my brain and yes. mm. your show was one of the first things that came up and I was like oh not only do I get more Aspire but I also get exactly like you said the best part of role playing games just making yeah. the character right, <laughs> just, the, just the beginning so. <laughs> the part that all of us do and then don't ever get to the game yeah which yep. reminds me now I I don't know if we'll put this in the show or the outtakes or whatever but I was told by one of my friends to ask you about your new game that you're working on, mm. because that one also uses resistance, doesn't it? Um, I, or kind of. Yeah. So I. Or am I thinking of something no, else? No, no, no. That's I am like in the cusp of like making my next fantasy game, which is a um, it's Lumen, but I'm going to borrow elements of the resistance that I mm -hmm. like a lot, especially the um, dice pool system. The idea of yes. like building a pool out of skills and domains and things like that is awesome mm -hmm. to me. Um, mm -hmm. I'm still going back and forth on whether or not I want to do my my um, sped up version of how Fallout is resolved compared to base resistance. Um, I may do that, mm -hmm. may not. I don't know. I'm like, I'm going There's super back like, and forth. So many fiddly bits to like decide. <laughs> That's the part of like game design that I just can't like wrap my head around how people do it is like all of those little tiny decisions. I just get so overwhelmed by them. I'm like, as a broad <laughs> concept, here's what I want to do. Yeah. Why isn't it doing that? <laughs> just, just be now. Just, just be do now. it. We'll like, I it. decided on a thing. Like, I made two choices and I don't understand why it's not right. working. <laughs> I end up making a list of, like, way too many choices. And then I go, what have I done? Uh, because I do truly like to make simple and fast games. And so it's it's for me, it's always, like, way overshoot and then, like, chisel, 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 chisel until it yeah. becomes a thing that I want. So I overproduce in my own head and in, my like, my Google Docs. And then I... I literally talk myself out of doing the things that I've written down. That's my process is to go, OK, I love Pat that. Spencer had an idea. And it's not a bad idea. It's just not the idea we need right now. Uh, right. And Spencer but like, will fix maybe, this. <laughs> maybe Spencer could put that idea over here right. for another time. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I love that. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit more about yourself? I know and you're working on lots and lots of projects. So anything else that you'd like to to plug or tell people about sure so um i'm i'm spencer campbell you might be familiar with the publishing name that i use which is uh, gila rpgs uh, i've been designing role-playing games uh out of chicago for about two and a half years now 
Uh, my very first game was called Score, which is a uh, homage to my love of crime. A lot of my games are mm. about crime, it turns out. Uh, <laughs> I have a brand. Crime is fun. Uh, it's very fun. And um, if you've um, heard of some of my other games, um, it's likely going to be um, Slayers, which is my fantasy, my fantasy monster hunter game in a cursed city. Mm-hmm. Uh, I also created the Lumen system, which is what Nova, what we're talking about today, is based off of. And it's a power fantasy SRD that I created to emulate video games and power fantasy vibes and stuff like that. And uh, it turns out a lot of people like, liked it and made stuff, which was the coolest feeling in the world to see mm-hmm. other people yeah. make things for your stuff. So, uh, yeah, that's that's generally who I am and some of the stuff that I've done. Very cool. cool. I've I've heard I heard like nothing but lumen for like a, <laughs> like there was like a couple of months where like that was all of my circle of people was talking about was like lumen mm-hmm. and all the things that they were going to do with it and it was like okay i probably should look into this and now you know like months and months later like we're finally getting around to it we, but yeah. we like inevitably people were super excited about it like and i see why oh, thank having you. read through it now but like it was like <laughs> wow okay like this is clearly something that i need to figure out because <laughs> it was it was really popular really fast it feels like it um, I'm sure we'll we'll talk about this, but uh, it was, you know, it came together very quickly because it was fueled out of rage and spite when I designed it. And so uh, mm, all the best things yeah, are. So that uh, creation process made me make it very quickly. And other people rode that wave with me uh, and it just kind of carried for a while, which was good. <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. Amazing. <laughs> Uh, Well, I am really excited to learn about this game. Uh, So let's go ahead and get into this, and we can start by discussing what this game is all about. What's in a game? So what is the core concept of Nova? So Nova is a power fantasy combat sort of game that uh, where you take place as um, exosuit pilots in a world where the sun has exploded, which is normally Ooh. a pretty bad thing. Turns out it's bad for the game of Nova as well. Uh, so the sun <laughs> explodes uh, and it crashes down these shards of sunlight uh, into the planet. And you play as these pilots that are fueled by these sun shards and you go out into the dangerous haunted twisted world that, that comes from a sun exploded planet uh, to try and uh, bring back technology, revive your your city, and and what I say, bring a new dawn. Mm, I like that. Yeah, I love the concept of like the sun shard. Like, I don't know why that is the part that grabs me. It's just like, what is it? What does it do? Where did it come from? Why do we have it? Like, I don't. Just, I really like those little bits where it's just like one, like the little bit of a word mm. of like sun shard. It's like, oh. Cool. <laughs> yeah, my um, you know, the the very earliest forms of what uh the the world of Nova came from was years ago, like I think 2018 or something. The the 200 word RPG contest that's held every mm. year. One of the themes might have been 2018 or 19 was the sun is dead. Um and from that my buddy Mike Greeman, who has done the art and layout for a number of my games, um sp- like Slayer's Almanac most recently. Um, mm-hmm. we just sat there and talked about like, what would it be like to be in a world where the sun exploded? And it, we went down this wild path and like the sun shards and the sun wells and these ideas kind of, um, got early percolation from that, uh, you know, trying to take all that to 200 words was a challenge, but, uh, but just, yeah. uh, the early like groundwork for what this world would be came from Mike and I just sitting on a Sunday morning, drinking coffee, going like, wow, what would happen if the sun was not like not just gone it exploded and and rained down on right (laughs) yeah which it gets a little bit into our our next question which is what kind of setting do you play in um are there particular things Mm. that you really wanted to highlight about this kind of world you know like you mentioned the difference between just like not having a sun and the sun having exploded like what what parts of that did you really want to play around with yeah because you you know you hear that the sun explodes and you go well game over right like, right, right. <laughs> okay why why, why is this we book 70 some pages I don't know. <laughs> um so you know you have to do a little bit of hand wavy science explanation for it which i'm i'm always fine to do a little hand waviness with that um and the i the what i think is special or different about it is it is certainly a post apocalypse game but it is one in which the the world the setting that you kind of base yourselves out of is actually extremely advanced 
because the idea is shards of sun of the literal sun have planted themselves into the surface of the the planet and cities were built around them and you know the concept mm. of a dyson sphere where we like capture a star and harvest it for infinite energy like this is basically mm. that but at a much smaller scale at like a city scale so like a city yeah. powered by a shard of the sun would rapidly advance in technology and things like that which is why you get these really powerful and interesting mechs that the characters play as these sparks because suddenly we are way more powerful and advanced than we'd ever been before. We just have to worry about everything that goes past the sunlight into the dark right. dusk outside of it. So it's an interesting mm. kind of combination of really advanced, powerful sci-fi going on and horrifying post-apocalypse gloom and doom. Everything, you know, anything out in the shadows is we have to really hope that this technology is caught up enough to fight whatever's out there. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a really interesting dichotomy. And I think like the light and dark mm. of it and like getting to play with both and having it be directly related exactly to light and dark is a really cool concept. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you, you know, these characters are extremely powerful, right? And that's a big part of the Lumen system and everything like that. And so you you feel powerful when you're building the city and imagining everything that's inside of it. And then the GM gets to have the fun of going, okay, well, I have this big, weird, mysterious horror zone that is 90% of the planet. So let me think <laughs> about what I can do that would make you go, oh, maybe we're not Maybe we're not as ready for this as we thought we were. <laughs> oh, I thought oh. it was so cool, but maybe. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I'm getting some like eldritch horror feels from the darkness. Yeah, mm -hmm. I loosely allude to this sort of stuff. Like there's going to certainly just be baddies out there that are just like maybe the baddies you're used to. But then you also have to imagine that a planet where the sun has gone away is going to start to like twist and turn the life that lives outside of it. And mm -hmm. so you get these elements of like beasts that are out there that are very strange. And there's a cult that worships the moon because naturally if the sun is gone, then the moon's going to be our next best thing in terms of like celestial bodies to worship and so you're gonna get this really creepy gnarly moon cult out there and then oh yeah i've got mean birds in my games because i have a brand that is also if not crime i love crows uh and so mm. i have a faction that has appeared in multiple games and it started to appear in other people's games called the corvus dominion they're this weird avian alien species and uh mm. they were on our planet when the sun exploded so they're stuck here with us and they're not happy about it so <laughs> you've got moon cults you've got twisted beasts and you've got angry alien birds who are also very advanced all vying for the very few sun shards that are out there wanting this this resource this technology that is the only bastion of of life on the planet oh that's really interesting and i think about like all of the creepy stuff under the ocean mm. where the sun isn't oh no like i'm just like as we're doing this i'm thinking of all of like the gross descent into midnight conversations we've had about like creatures that can't see the light like and like don't you know plants that don't do photosynthesis yeah. because yeah. there is no sun and like or sun uh, shards at the bottom of the ocean uh, right like what mm. what suddenly happens to these creatures <laughs> that have never been exposed to the sun before where oh. now there's this like furious power and light in their environment does it cook them or do they change? And I'm going to say they change, right? That's way more. Right, because that's cooler. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. For sure. Um, and then sun shards on the moon. That moon's got to look wicked amazing right. in the sky. <gasps> like the moon, oh, it's probably all spiky. I imagine the moon is kind of ever present in the sky now because it's got all these, it's pockmarked with sun shards. So it is kind of this weird, like semi-glowing thing in the sky, which absolutely would yeah. encourage people to go, well, that's our new thing. That's the thing that we, right. <laughs> we love. Uh -huh. <laughs> All right. <laughs> wow. Oh, that's amazing. Uh, so what tools do we need to play this game then? Um, to play the game, you, you, you need the book. You need some character sheets. There's a reference sheet too, which I always like having a nifty reference sheet. Um, and then in terms of dice, you only need D6, uh, six-sided dice. That's hmm. the only dice that I use. Um that's truly all that you need. Um, and but I know that some people uh, 
we'll talk about this. Nova uses um, theater of the mind as a, a space for combat. We don't use a, a grid necessarily, but I know that different people have different abilities to visualize components in their mind's eye. So I, you know, I recommend that maybe grab a sheet of paper and some tokens or something to represent where things might be on a battlefield if you uh, need that sort of stuff. I've also seen plenty of people who like to use tokens for health and fuel, which is the, the two main resources in the game, rather than like erasing and uh, writing on your sheet yeah. again, like use some, use some yeah. fun tokens. Um, but truly, uh, just just to, to hop in, somebody's got to have that book to have read it uh, and some character <laughs> sheets and some six-sided dice and you're ready to rock and roll. Very cool. I have to say, I'm a big fan of quick reference mm. pages. Like I'm on record on our show too, talking about how like I think books that are more than like 25 or 30 pages should have a rules mm. reference at the beginning. So I know what I'm getting into. <laughs> um, but I like that you have one that's just like the one page reference guide that like, because mm -hmm. my brain is like, okay, here's what I actually need to know right away. And then I can dig into the rest of it as I see. Exactly. Bit. I mean, so I, I, before I got into role playing games, I was really into board games, still really am into board games, and I was trying to design them as well. And so I know how important for once a board game becomes even just slightly complex, having a quick reference card or something like that, that each player can have in front of them will just immediately smooth out a lot of the, the hurdles that you're going to run into. So having seen it be so important in board games, it felt like you, you got to have something like this in a game. Even if, right, because board game rule books are only like 10 pages, and that's too right, much. So. <laughs> right, like even if I, in my mind, imagine Nova as a rules-like game, that doesn't mean that it's inherently like easy and you can hold everything in your brain, right? You're going to want that sheet there, so you can't, you shouldn't have to hold all this in your brain. Right. Nobody should have to do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, especially the first couple times, right. too, you know, like it's... When you get into a campaign of a game, usually by like the third or fourth session, I'm like, okay, I've got mm -hmm. this. Um, but yeah, in that first couple, it's like, okay, hold on. How do I roll initiative again? I don't remember. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and like, I wrote the game and I still need it, right? Like, I look at it right. and I go like, okay, so uh, which iteration I of Lumen I is this? Because I did it different in it. every <laughs> single game I've ever made. <laughs> so uh, right. uh, it's, it's, uh, it's yep. nice to have. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, what kind of stories and themes were you hoping people would explore with this game? Um, we talked a little bit about like the, the light mm. and the dark parts, um, but are there other things that you were really hoping people would use this to, to look through and work through? So um, Nova at its core is a power fantasy game because it is designed with Lumen, which is a, a power fantasy uh uh, system. So it is designed for your characters to feel powerful. Uh, you are designed to go out as uh, these very powerful, cool mechs and, you know, you're going to face these horrifying things that we've just been talking about, but you're also going to succeed. And that's a big thing mm -hmm. that um, I just, I like to make that clear ahead of time with some of my games. The players are here to win and the GM is oh, here. Oh, so it's not Warhammer it's, then? It's not, it's not Warhammer. <laughs> and it's not adversarial where it's GM versus players. It's, yeah. these players are going to go have a really cool, fascinating challenging but interesting mission that they're going to go on out into this dark. But the GM is not there to stop them from doing it. They're not there to to kill them. In fact, you can't die in Nova. <laughs> I've made a rule that makes it very, very hard for you to die. Um, so that more so it is about going out into this world that is dark and horrifying and trying to accomplish things that will help make things better. Like the tagline of the game is to bring a new dawn, which has an in, inherent in that this concept of okay, we are going to overcome this. We are going to succeed. It's just there's going to be these kind of terrifying things that are going to stop us or try to stop us, we will do it. That new dawn will be brought. Uh, it's just a matter of what we're going to have to do to make that happen. Um, so mm -hmm. my, my goal is to tell these powerful stories. Um, again, kind of leaning, since it's Lumen, it definitely leans into a more combat focus in it than other things. But that doesn't mean you're all, it's just fight, 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 fight. But it is designed to, when you get into a fight, feel very cool and then go explore this dark world and then get into another cool fight and then explore this dark world and you kind of cycle that again and again. So the GM is there mostly to give you those things to fight and give you those things to explore um, rather than to try and take you out or, it, you know, like it's supposed to be a level of challenge, but not 
yeah you know, exactly overpowering. it's 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 not there to put a wall up it's there to put hurdles that's how i think about it so um yeah. the gm turn in lumen is one that encourages the gm to add a twist every round of combat that forces the players to change the way that they cool. think about how the, they're winning because mm. they're winning that's really they're, cool. they're going to win so like if you know that they're just pushing forward in this line i'm going to just put a hurdle here so you can either like fight over that hurdle or you can take a different path so my goal is just to like make you explore the concept of different paths rather than say sorry this is blocked off this is a wall you're not going any further with this um i really like that because it makes each turn interesting too right like there's i've read a number of um like D adventures mm. lately um and a lot of them are just like okay do this thing and then this round n- now it's harder mm. But you still are doing the same thing, but now it's a little harder. And it's like, okay, but like by round five, aren't we all over this? Like, I don't like, oh, I hit it with a sword harder, I guess. Like, you know, like I want it to be interesting. Like if we are going to do combat, because that's my biggest thing with combat, Mm. not being interesting. is It's like, okay, I hit it with a sword and I hit it with a sword and I hit it with a sword. And it's like, so if something changes there every round and like keeps it interesting and it's like, okay, you can't do this again now what do you want to do mm. um it it makes doing a combat heavy game more satisfying for me yeah you know i i give an incredible amount of narrative freedom to the gm to do this this gm turn which is what it's called which is to to activate some of the enemies and then change the, the battle in some interesting way and you know I, I provide some advice in the book but i don't want to be too prescriptive when i do these sorts of things where i don't want to say like Okay, and then put a, a barrier up. That's the common mm-hmm. thing you do in round one. And then reinforcements in round two. I want you to think contextually, like what makes sense in the fiction for the enemies mm-hmm. to respond? Because they are facing these unbelievably powerful robots. <laughs> and like what, what right. will these enemies do desperately and fight dirty to try and stop these robots as best they can? You get to play around Well, and that. it should depend depend on what the players are doing too exactly. right? you know like it doesn't make sense it's like okay well now they move faster and it's like well that doesn't make sense because i did you mm-hmm. know like we messed with the terrain or whatever um and so i think having it be too prescriptive starts to not make sense either if your players aren't you know following that same prescription yeah. mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly well we we heard a bit about uh what characters mm-hmm. do uh in the game already going out and and fighting insurmountable odds and and uh and and winning i'm um, curious there, why they do that yeah like, why is like, that is, what there, is there a reason behind the the characters uh fighting for that um and and do you get any of that like the the downtime mm-hmm. stuff yeah so um there are there's sort of a there's mission generators that are in the game to help kind of contextualize why you're going out there and so some things might just be hey we've you know we've picked up our scouts have picked up there's a moving force out there that we're worried is going to come to the city and sometimes it's just like we gotta we gotta head these people off before they come these these mean birds are gonna try and steal our son <laughs> we need to stop them. Um, oh i hate when sometimes they do you need to do that um, there's a lot of elements in the game that are about going in and um, recovering or protecting important things that are out there in the world that, you know, these sun shards only landed in some places, which means there's a lot of the planet that's still out there. It's desolate, but there could be valuable things there. Like, yes, technology has boomed around these cities, but we are also having to relearn a lot of what we have established as a species over the, mm. the lifespan. And so there's there's knowledge out there, there's resources, and there's things like that that nobody else can go out and do. The The concept is the dusk. Everything that's outside of your city is so twisted and dangerous that to send a, a, a non-spark, a person without a robot suit on them out there, is a, you just you wouldn't even consider it. You wouldn't do it, yeah. And so you are the only people who can go out there and try and find things that might be the elements that might start to help build up your city. And so, yeah, you you asked that idea of like downtime. And that's the thing that uh, the game encourages you after missions is to think about what did the, what did the city, how did it benefit from what you just did? Um, okay. Either, you know, there's no, there's no mechanical base building in the core game. So there's no like, okay, your technology level raises plus one because of this. It's more, why did we go out there? Like which faction sent us out there and what did they mm-hmm. gain from it? And then maybe because they've gained, did another faction lose out in the power structure of the city? And how are you as oh. in theory, a relatively neutral force in the city going to balance this total, di- um, total um, 
you know, fight for resources and, and time and everything like that mm. in a world where, yeah, technology is cool, but it's also really still scary out there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, what do you think? I, I particularly want to ask because it's because it uses mm. lumen. Um, and as you mentioned, like lots of people have have taken and done that done things with Lumen. What do you think makes Nova unique in general and then particularly among those games using Lumen? Mm, yeah. Um, yeah. Pe- uh, one of my favorite things when people started making things with Lumen is, you know, I released this SRD with like general thoughts about what this should make. And then every single person read it. Uh, and then a lot of my friends who read it and made things, they would reach out and say, hey, Spencer, um, cool SRD. I'm going to change X, Y, and Z. And I, every single time I went, perfect, good. It, you should, Great. Not, Sounds awesome. you should not do it, you know, word for word from the, the book, do, you know, make it your own. And so what I think makes Nova unique and kind of weird is that I wrote Lumen and then I made Nova and I immediately made Nova with a huge change to how Lumen works. So Nova combat, <laughs> there's, zero rolling done there's no rolling done in combat instead your Hmm. your sparks have a suite of powers um, and you are just spending fuel which is a resource that you have that allows you to activate those powers and so rather than thinking is my attack going to hit it will hit it will absolutely hit the question is which power is going to help you the most or your team the most in this moment? And so mm-hmm. combat is more about a it's a it's a puzzle solving sort of thing. I like to think of a lot of my combat games as more puzzle solving than just mm. rolling and trying to get the odds in your favor, because, again, the odds are in your favor. You're very powerful robots. So now yeah. how do you want to it's more how do you want to do this all the time? Um, my my mentality is if I can give my players a button that says do something cool. I don't want them to just be able to push it once per fight or like once per session. I want them to just keep pushing that button. Um, and so that's what Nova is designed to do. So I, I immediately deviated from the Lumen <laughs> rules, which is, you know, maybe <laughs> roll for attacks and things like that. Instead, I just said, no, you're just going to, it will work. It's just choosing each round the thing that is going to help you in that moment, which then plays well with the GM turn where they are now trying to think, okay, I'm learning what the powers are of these sparks. What can I do that's going to make them have to do a different power? So they're not just doing the same thing again. They're not just swinging their sword over and over. Uh, They're not just doing Mm -hmm. this same Mm -hmm. thing again. But now I've done something that sort of nullifies it or reduce its effectiveness. Um, Yeah, I really liked the when I was reading through it, the concept of not having to roll for those powers because it does it does really play into that power fantasy of like, oh, Mm. I'm good at this. Like, there's no question of like, can you do this? I can do it. It's just a matter of like, does it how much does it help me Mm. long term? And like, is this the right choice for the situation? It's not like, am I competent or not? Yeah. And that's always been a thing that has frustrated me with with other games where there are these sorts of like roll to hit thing where you're like, well, if I'm like a level 12 fighter, I'm probably going to hit, yeah. right? Like I'm pretty good at using a sword at this point. And, <laughs> like you would think, right? And then, then you don't. And it's it feels it feels weird. The, the, the fi- it's like this is my whole thing. I've trained my whole life for this. Like this is what I do. <laughs> right. mm-hmm. Why can't I do it? You know, and then it's like and then why am I not having an existential crisis about that? Because it feels like that should be a mechanic too. Then. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> So that that like that weird dissonance that gets created in the narrative and the fiction at the table when we have these moments where we know we're capable and then we just fail because probability dictates that every once in a while you're going to fail. Uh, And Mm -hmm. so I didn't want that in Nova. I wanted to capture that concept of, no, you're going to you're going to do it. It's just is this the thing that you want to do? You've got four powers. Is this the power right now that you want to use? Um, mm. Or does one of your other ones help you in this moment? Uh, and I, so I, I like to think of it as a more puzzle solvey power fantasy thing, as opposed mm. to you're always hitting, always hitting because you just have a D20 and everyone else is rolling D4s. Uh, it's, right. <laughs> uh, so I think that's the thing that makes it unique. The other the other big thing that I talk about a lot with Nova is that I consider characters in Nova to be level 20 characters. I consider you to be you're there. You did it. You are the robot. Um, and to me, I think about playing Nova uh, and and creating and changing your character with time as um, creating builds 
So it's like the like a late game MMO sort of thing where you're like, okay, I'm max level. Hmm. What gear do I want? And I know we're going to talk about yeah. advancement at some point, so I won't, oh, yeah, yeah. I won't dive in. But like that concept of like which mods you choose to change your powers is the that's the play. Not I get more oh. powerful. It's you are powerful. How do you want to be powerful? <laughs> is is the yeah. question. Uh, all of this is tickling my min max brain. <laughs> yep. So much uh, because like that, that whole like what what is the best thing I can do mm. in this very specific situation? Um, and then what what choices can I make to to just up my my ability and power just a little bit more? And 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 how will that help in the future? Because of the based on the missions that we've been going on and yeah, and what's kind of on the horizon. Oh, that's so good. It's you know, folks will always come up with new interesting builds for Sparks that I couldn't possibly have predicted when I come up with when I came up with the mods and everything. And so it's always fun to think like this is my pyre, and my pyre plays by a really different way than maybe Spencer had assumed pyre plays. Mm-hmm. And that's yeah. cool. I love that. <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, before we get into the terms and concepts and then character creation, uh, we like to talk about the history of the game. Uh, so so when did uh, you start development on this? Uh, I know you were talking about the, the 200 mm. uh, word RPG that kind of sparked the uh, the whole setting and everything. Uh, but when did when did development on uh, Lumen and Nova actually start then yeah so i i i had to do a little research because i i knew this was one of the questions and i was like when when did i actually start this <laughs> uh, it, 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 it flies and it blurs together because it is nova is part of a line of lumen games that i've sort of created that all kind of created they fed into each other and so um trying to unravel that knot i needed to do a little bit of uh research um Mm mine so nova the concept of what would become nova setting wise absolutely kind of originates from mike and i's early talks from that 200 rpg the concept of what mechanically and what would be developed into nova um came in march of last year so um march of last year i was i released a kickstarter for five hours uh which was for a a game called frame (laughs) um amazing well no 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 not amazing (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh no because, <laughs> five, well, five hour kicks i've, I've never that, heard of such that a... would be kind of nice actually because i don't like doing long kickstarters um no. yeah i know like how do you how do you sleep for that whole like it's month not, you don't uh-huh. you simply don't um, oh okay <laughs> uh I, so i made a game called frame which was my love letter to um warframe uh and okay. i uh, created a kickstarter for it and then uh immediately uh apparently made the Warframe fans very mad. Um, and they basically did a targeted harassment uh, campaign against me. Oh, no. So I closed it after five hours because uh, they had sort of invaded every social space that I existed on online. Um, so what did ugh. you do that made them so angry? They they have a, a deep belief that the, the property, the concept of like exosuits and things like that is belongs to digital extremes and is theirs and more importantly that if they tell the company that this random indie rpg guy out of chicago is making something that is an homage to it that the company will love them that that is a thing that the company wants you to do is be a snitch um and so (laughs) what kind of corporate nonsense is that it it was so it was horrible it was really really bad and i i disappeared for a a little while and wow i came back um f- like i said at the beginning of this fueled with rage and curious spite. um <laughs> yeah and uh I, I understand that now wow and so i did like an interview with chase carter at Dicebreaker about it uh and talked basically said like I, gamers mean nothing to me anymore I, I just i can't stand the concept of a, of a gamer now because of things like this and uh so i i sat down and i said well, I made a really cool game. Frame is a very cool game, and I don't want to just get rid of it. So what can I do with it? Let me strip away all the coat of paint that is going to make the Warframe people mad and move in a new <laughs> coat of paint that is distinct enough that hopefully won't uh, raise any uh, riots against me. Um, wow. Yeah. So uh, in March, uh, I started working on the early concepts of what would become Nova uh, because. 
uh, uh, both thematically and mechanically, because it was an evolution of what Frame was. And Frame was very much this idea of you are these very cool, powerful exosuit people, and you're using powers all the time, and you're just spending tokens and resources to do that. And I said, that's really fun. Then we just put it in a new world. And so March is when Nova kind of began to emerge. And then I realized I need to codify this a little bit more. And so I, in April, I designed Lumen. So I made Lumen Hmm. the SRD as a guide for me to go back to Nova. So I said, I need, I need, I need to kind of understand like why frame was designed the way that it was because i just i just wrote mm-hmm. it and so i gave it context by stripping out all everything but the mechanics and i said this is lumen now this is the rule system by which frame and my first game in the system light was made now i can use this to to build and create this concept of nova and so it went oh that's so cool so it was like backwards and then yeah forwards again. they kind of like it so like cool. i said the, the lumen games fed into each other like technically the first one is light which is my homage to destiny and destiny fans never came after me uh they they love <laughs> I, light. Know, well, I was gonna say i have friends who are like all about yeah. it like so yeah so light came about it it was it's technically lumen like but it was before i had even the idea of what lumen was and so Mm. that helped me make frame and then when i cut it all away i said okay i think i could see the the thing i was going for between light and frame let me transform that into this thing called lumen and this will be my guide this will be my skeleton that i can build future games off of and then Mm. nova kind of very rapidly uh came uh came together after that it just it just flowed out of me uh it was it was a lot of fun to write absolutely and and that uh became like the illuminated by by lumen yeah it sort of Uh, it sort of became the the first one that got that that phrase that that sticker slapped on it and it's like i said it's kind of weird because the the core assumptions of lumen are that you do roll (laughs) when you attack Um, you're still gonna most Mm -hmm. likely hit but you're still gonna roll and to me i was like no 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 i just gotta get straight to the Mm -hmm. i gotta get straight to the very very cool power stuff um and so it's been fun to not only see how nova immediately deviated from lumen but how other things did too and just I'm always, like I said, I'm blown away with what people did with the system because it is, I, I cannot even comprehend the amount of creativity and directions people have taken with it. It's it's very, very cool. I love that about this community. Like there are certainly parts of like gamers in general and the RPG community that are like, <laughs> um, but just the, the cool stuff that people make and the way that they take things like SRDs mm-hmm. or even just hacks of games and like make totally different things that you're like oh you changed one rule and it looks nothing like the thing that i just made and it's like the creativity is just it's baffling to me like i just i want to be able to do that (laughs) like and i i'm just i'm always shocked and awed at like the cool stuff that people come up with and the way that they they take Mm -hmm. these things and are like here's how it applies to like Mm. my world and my fandom and my cool concept. Like it just, it blows my mind. It's so cool. It's so cool. You know, I I got my design start in like hacks and stuff like that. And so like, to me, I understand how important it is to have resources out there that help somebody just jump right into design rather than saying, I need to make something brand new from scratch. And that's because that's overwhelming. And so a big philosophy for many, many, many of my games is to make it immediately hackable or really easy for you to make your own class or set a pack of monsters or enemies. So, and Mm -hmm. people, I I, I still just randomly discover things. Like I just go, oh, here's a Slayers class that I had no idea existed, but somebody out there was like, I really (laughs) want to make a Slayers class based off of blank. And then they do it and I go, whoa, this is super cool. And uh, exactly like you said, (laughs) people can inject their own fandoms the things that they're excited about the the things that they want to experience at the table and if i just give them a, a, a very malleable skeleton then they can they can do that and i love that about like indie design mm. especially that more and more designers are you know are putting those srds out there and and saying like please like tell me about the cool thing that you've yeah. made because like i know even making this show like hearing people have like 
you know, like taking one of our concepts and then put it in their mm. own game or, you know, that they found something through us. So, like, I get so excited about that. And so I always like it sucks when there's like bigger companies that are like, mm, you can't put that out there. You can't share that because it's part of our game. And then all of these indie designers are like, no, please, like, tell me about the cool thing that you did. <laughs> like, I want to see what you do with it, because that's like my favorite part right. of like any kind of creative project is like knowing that it inspired somebody else. Yeah. Um. And so I love that about the indie space and about the stuff like that you're doing and other people are doing with those kinds of things and saying like, please like, tell me the cool <laughs> thing. Like, tell me about what you did because we just like all want to have a moment of like excitement together. Yeah. yeah uh -huh. It's, I, I love it. The, the, I've, I've been very fortunate to be part of some very cool communities in the, the indie RPG scene that just truly fuel one another. It's just, it's, it's very nice. And, uh, it, it it made it so much easier and approachable for me to even begin, you know, considering getting into design when I found people who who build you up immediately and say, hey, mm -hmm. this is the thing that you're really interested in. You should go talk to this person because they are also really interested in this thing. And then, you you know, you right? find the people, you make the <laughs> things. It's 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 great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm I'm glad that like you've had it seems like the total opposite experience now with Lumen mm -hmm. and Nova that you had before um, mm -hmm. and that you're. But it didn't totally like ruin game design for you it because was real close. like <laughs> it's, I mean and that like would have been so sad like because mm -hmm. now like looking at the things that you've done since then like that would have just been like heartbreaking and I, I hate that like that happens for so many people like there are so many people who don't come yeah. back from that you know and it's such mm -hmm. a bummer it's such a bummer that like there are so many people who've had it ruined because people are garbage well and, and just to, to oh. you know to uh, echo that sentiment of community. I had so many very close friends that I had made who are in the, you know, fellow indie designers and the amount of outreach and support that came from them, you know, privately when I had stepped away from everything was just incredible. Like I wasn't, I mm -hmm. wasn't just like, okay, I'm going away and no, <laughs> and I'm right. just some random guy like who's going cared. away. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. you know, a lot of people were very kind and that, that helped. Uh, but I am also a very spiteful uh, person. So I was, uh, <laughs> the likelihood that I was going to just step away and be like, no, nah, I guess I'll just go away. No, I had to, I had to do something. So right. Lumen, yeah. Lumen had to Like, I have a point yeah, to prove. Lumen had to be made. <laughs> I appreciate that. Mm-hmm. Um, we are super close to starting our character creation, but before we do that, um, if we can go over some terms and mm. concepts that you think people might need to know, I jotted down a couple as I was like looking through and trying to pick what kind of character I want oh, to cool. play. Um, but if you have any others that you, you wanted to talk about, um, before, yeah, so before we start so that people can follow totally. along. So a Lumen character is generally just a handful of components. One of those components is, are these three things, your attributes. Um, uh, a, a concept of Lumen is not that you have skills that dictate what you can do. The assumption, again, is that you, you can do pretty much anything because you're very capable, powerful people. So what's more important is how you do things. Um, so there are three attributes that typically describe approaches to how you might accomplish uh, a task. And so in, Lu or in Nova, they um, are sun, moon, and shade. Sun, it describes anytime you're doing something very powerful, sweeping, uh, but also like highly emotional. The moon is going to be your quick, reactive uh, sort of stuff. And then shade is going to be your slow, methodical, practiced sort of uh, approaches to doing things. You can think about these both in and out of combat. So those those are the way that you approach uh, things. They also sometimes are linked to some powers. So some powers do damage, for example, equal to your sun. So if you look at your powers and you go, oh, this one's linked to sun, I might want to put a lot of points into sun so that I really hit hard with this power. Um, that's that's a thing to consider. The other um, maybe like stat, so to speak, that you have, or you have health and fuel. Health is health. Uh, when you when you reach zero, though, oh, okay. yeah. when you reach zero, <laughs> though, the difference in Nova is that you don't die. You actually activate your supernova, which is a, basically a fail safe that your suit has, which is an mm. unbelievably powerful attack that your suit does uh, to bring you back to life and usually devastates everybody who was a threat around you. So um, wow. you, you stand right back up next round uh, after having <laughs> sort of leveled the, the, the battlefield. So um, going to zero is not the end of the world. In fact, uh, I have played with people who strategically get themselves to zero in certain points because they know this is the time I need to activate my supernova. <laughs> wow. Um, so... I'd be one of those. Yeah. Two. So health is that. <laughs> Fuel is your other thing, which is it is um, 
it's just a resource that you spend to activate your powers. So anytime you want to use a power, you spend one fuel to do it. All powers cost one fuel. And uh, doing that just lets you do the thing on your turn. Um, both of those are also constantly being recovered in combat. Um, it's like I said, this is very inspired by video games. You know how enemies in video games, when you kill them, they like drop health and ammo yeah. and stuff? That happens in Lumen. So when an enemy dies, there's a chance that they will drop fuel and or health for you to pick back up. So you are meant to just kind of keep going and keep going. So you're not worried about spending up your fuel because you keep taking out some enemies, you're probably going to get some more fuel back. Um, so those are kind of your stats. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, your character has um, a set of powers. They have a passive power, which is just there to sort of give you a sense of what your, your role generally is in the battlefield. Um, so... For example, Pyre just does damage to somebody that they're next to at the start of every turn. That lets you know that Pyre wants to be next to people um, so that they can hurt people. And then you have mm -hmm. four active powers. And these are the things, these are the buttons that you get to push during your turn. This, these are the things where you go, okay. which of these four powers do I want to do on my turn? Uh, and they, they're they typically in the range of doing some sort of damage across the field, but not necessarily. There are also some classes that are in the realm of um, support or tanks or, you know, more of that crowd control stuff. So you look and think, which power helps me in this moment? Um, those are the concepts of what makes up a spark. I think the other thing that might help is the idea of um, the ranges. So um, when you are, you know, these powers are defined by um, how far away something is. So um, things can either be close, near, far, uh, in terms of like who they can target. Because like I said, this is all done with um, theater of the mind rather than measuring out squares mm. on a, a, a grid or anything like that. So um, those will be some keywords to also be on the lookout as you're thinking about your powers. and that Because that will help you understand like, oh, this person seems like they want to be up close a lot. Or this person tends to stay, stay back and they're mostly at that near mm -hmm. and far range with their powers. Um, the last concept are your mods. Like I said, uh, it's about builds in Nova rather than leveling up. And so you have a suite of different mods that during character creation you can choose from and you'll just keep getting more of these as you play. Um, some of these mods are just designed to be persistent. They are just there to give you like small little boons. So a little bit of health, uh, you know, permanent increase to health or any of those attributes or anything like that. Um, and then there are power mods that um, you can slot into your powers. Um, some of them are designed to help a specific power and then others are just something like plus one harm. You plug that into any of your powers and any harm that that power does now does more harm or plus one range. If a power only hurt people at close range and you slap that mod into it, now it does uh, the same effect at close and near. So that's what I mean by oh, like, nice. you create the build, you create the the way that you function on the field that fits your vibe and also what the, the your party needs. If, if you suddenly realize you're all up close and personal, you go, okay, maybe I will take a range mod so that we can deal with something that's not always directly in our faces <laughs> all the time. Uh -huh. So yeah, I love that they're super easy too, that they're, they are just like, okay, it does this now. And it's like, cool, I can mm -hmm. just make a little note that's like, this is plus one. And like, you know, they're super e easy to slot in and like not have to look up 800 different things. Yeah. And I, I hate, <laughs> I hate advancement in games where I'm like, okay, now what do I take? Where does it go? How do uh -huh. I, you know, like I can only increase 15% mm. based on where I bought the skill, <laughs> Ryan. <laughs> the, the goal is for in the mods to not have to learn a bunch of new keywords or new elements to the game, but for these mods to enhance the core rules that you are, you, that you become familiar with. And then, a matter of just tweaking your experience by shifting and changing mods throughout your sessions to go like, okay, I was playing with a lot of range, but I think we're like good on range. And I think I just want to hurt, like I want to just hurt more. So I'm going to just like do take more, some more yeah. harm <laughs> or I'm actually burning through my fuel a lot. So I'm going to take the mod that like doesn't cost, this power doesn't cost fuel now. Um, and, you know, mm -hmm. things like that so that you can just find the find the way that your spark will shine as brightly as possible out in the on the missions very cool uh oh well, i am uh, super excited to dive into this uh and see what sort of sparks we create and and everything uh so are, are we ready to to bake some people i am ready let's make some people i'm excited 
there's a lot of options. Mm-hmm. What what uh, I, I guess for for mm. myself and for the audience, uh, what are our options for our spark? Yeah, should I do like a quick quick pitch of the spark options just to help? Yeah, out? if you yeah, could, yeah, like if we could do really like a quick helpful. like yeah. sentence or two about each of the choices. So the, when I when I created these sparks, I came up with the first four, and then the next four came after that, and I described them in lore in the book as wave one and wave two, where wave one was designed. Practically, we need these sort of sparks for these sorts of things and missions. And then wave two was, now let's get weird. Uh, and so you'll you'll <laughs> notice that things take a twist uh, in the second half of the spark options. So um, Pyre is going to be your in in your face fighter, big flaming sword. Uh, they love to get up up close and personal. Uh, so if you like a uh, kind of an aggressive fighter, Pyre is your choice. Scorch is going to be your sort of caster equivalent. Um, So they summon fire from around the field. They do a lot of um, sort of like manipulation of the field too. can can play a slight control Mm. or um, support role through that. So you like your wizards? Scorch. Um, Warden is your tank. Big, beefy tank. Uh, Slams down a shield, protects uh, friends, literally bull rushes around the battlefield, knocking people around. So if you like to be a bully, Warden. Uh, and then there is the uh, Voyager spark. And Voyager is um, the the scout, the pathfinder. Their whole thing is about marking mm. enemies to help amplify your your uh, your allies in combat, or to just generally do like weird trickery, like throwing down holograms and swapping people around and things like that. So if you like a um, kind of a um, a light range supporty role, uh, or like a more crowd control role, Voyager is for you. So those were like the practical ones. And then it got weird. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Pox, this is, where Pox I live. is the plague robot, <laughs> uh, specifically designed mm-hmm. to do like damage over time builds. So they start by infecting mm-hmm. enemies at the beginning of the fight, and then they try and spread it uh, and speed up the infection throughout the fight. Grim is the necromancer robot. <laughs> uh, they literally, uh, as, as Eddie uh, depicts in the art, uh, stab these sort of like shards into bodies on the field and reanimate them and control thralls. Oh, wow. Um, so like it's a, <laughs> what is I mean, that face, that just, Ryan? That's just, that just like it screams Amelia all it, over. It is. It's the one I circled. <laughs> like I said, it got weird when I was like, okay, I've got like the kind of the core concepts. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> Drifter is the mobile arsenal. Um, they are fantastic they're they're sort of a jack of all trades they have a power that handles each range and also are linked up to the attributes so you really play around with build customization with drifter i think almost more so than any other class uh drifter is also just very mm-hmm. powerful <laughs> yeah yeah then you have uh sanguine which is the vampire robot uh so mm-hmm. also strongly considered yeah, this one why <laughs> oh, this is the second i was thinking for me why not have a robot that is not only powered by the sun but by blood um sanguine specifically is about also spending some of your own health to get amplified versions of your powers so you're spending fuel but also mm. if you want you can start to spend health um but sanguine can also do a lot of like stealing health or moving health around and things like that. They also literally turn into a cloud of bats and fly around, which I think is pretty cool. <laughs> oh, amazing. That's pretty dope. Um, uh, that's, there's your blood magic, yeah. Amelia. I know. <laughs> no. And, and then so, <laughs> it's tough so choices, those, Brian. Those are all the sparks. <laughs> and then uh, Eddie wanted to do one more very cool one. And we we uh, raised the, the stretch goal money to make Infernal, which is literally the devil. <laughs> the devil as a robot. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, my, you know, my favorite thing about Infernal is that uh, if the supernova effect, if Infernal ever dies, everybody around Infernal gets dragged down to hell uh, with them. So uh, they are just mean <laughs> just me <laughs> mean and the devil <laughs> uh, so the, <laughs> that is also considered this one <laughs> amazing so yeah um it, it has been it has been a lot of fun like conceptualizing the like the lore so to speak of nova and, you know in my in my own head canon voyagers were the first sparks because we needed to scout out the area around us and then we built pyres to defend the voyagers and then we realized we needed like wardens to protect the pyres because they got themselves in trouble and then this the scorch mm-hmm. existed and we're like okay we did it and then humanity got weird and creative and we're like well we have the power yeah. let's make uh, vampire robots well let, let's see what yeah. else we can do and so right? that's as how- we do 
that yeah that's exactly what we would do uh <laughs> and that and that's amazing so that's a that's a quick rundown of the uh the nine sparks that are in nova oh so good do you have thoughts ryan i do have thoughts okay tell um, me your thoughts okay so i'm assuming that you're gonna go grim amelia <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I I do have to say it was a really difficult choice. Usually when we do these things, there's very clear, like, this one is the dark mm. magic one. Um, yeah. And that was you not got, the case. Three, I, had to, I had to choose. You got three dark magic choices. adjacent ones here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I know. Um, but, you know, uh, I, I don't know, um, Spencer, if you had one in mind for yourself. I, I kind of bounce back and forth. My, you know, my go to if I was playing this on my like, you know, a campaign, I would be such a, a scorch person. I, I'm a like a wizardy mm. caster sort of thing. And also scorch has a as a it dips into a little bit into support. And I actually really like playing mm-hmm. support characters. Um, but I think that's very much on brand in what I would normally do. So I'm, I'm trying to think of what would Spencer do if he broke out of his shell and, and tried tried something different oh we don't do that here (laughs) (laughs) that's not what we do (laughs) um so i feel like i am looking at sanguine because i i feel like i i don't look at sanguine enough as a spark even though i just love the concept of a vampire robot uh so i think i think that's what's drawing my eye right now okay oh that's very interesting because that's the one i was looking at oh well then i will gladly step aside because i uh i'm also (laughs) very interested in pops so uh, oh, then we can play the three we, that i wanted we can to play be the three <laughs> three gnarly or, ones. i guess i shouldn't say that i wanted there were like four that i wanted to choose because i looked at the infernal too but i also looked at uh-huh. us so we, we can be the uh the, the team amelia yeah team <laughs> amelia here <laughs> it's all about me today <laughs> <laughs> everything's coming up amelia you know yeah <laughs> I, I said that like all the stuff in the dusk is spooky and scary, but I think that the dusk would be pretty spooked and scared if they saw like a necromancer robot, a vampire robot, and a plague doctor robot come out. They'd be like, oh, actually, yeah. they're pretty spooky too. We're good. <laughs> We're good. We'll stay over here. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. So yes, first first step is making that difficult decision of which spark draws your eye and so um it sounds like we we have we've accomplished that so i truly believe that that is the the hardest part of character creation (laughs) wonderful um the next thing to do is to start programming your spark so those stats that i mentioned earlier the attributes and your health and fuel we determine those things so you you don't come preloaded with an attribute range but instead um all three of our attributes sun moon and shade all start at one And I should clarify what these numbers mean. Um, Anytime you do something that is described by those attributes, you roll a dice pool of D6s equal to that number. And you keep the highest one. So the the more the higher the number in the attribute, the more dice you roll, meaning the more likely you get to keep a high number and and get some good success on what you're accomplishing. Um, So we start with one in all of those things. uh, And then we have four points to allocate across those attributes how we see fit during uh, this process. The one Mm -hmm. uh, rule is that you can't have an attribute that is um, more than four points. So you can't dump all four points into sun or something like that. You have to at least dip a little bit into another attribute. Okay. Okay. Uh, So what does each one do, or is it dependent on what abilities you're using? It definitely depends on the, um, the, the spark that you chose. So some sparks are very dependent on their attributes where a lot of their powers are linked to attributes. So um, when I when it comes time to, to doing this step, I, I oftentimes encourage people to look at your powers and just first things first, do you see the words sun, moon, and shade popping up in powers or mods um, where like they deal, it deals that amount of harm or hits that many people? Because that immediately lets you know, okay, that's a cool sounding power. And it also tells me I need a lot of moon. So I should put, I should definitely at least put one more point into moon um Mm -hmm. other sparks that doesn't that's not really the case and they're just all flat numbers and so you can think more so about these attributes being how you accomplish everything outside of combat 
So like, let's say, for example, okay. you're trying to hack into a system. Um, mm-hmm. You would use sun to brute force your way into it. You would use like shade to do like a very slow, methodical process of like trying to crack the password. But, you know, that you might run out of time. And then moon is like the mm-hmm. fast hack sort of thing where you use like your intuition to try and guess the password based off of like context clues. So these attributes dictate your actions largely outside of combat. So you can if your powers aren't linked up to them, you can think, Okay, am I acting like really powerfully or am I acting really like quickly or am I more of a slow, methodical sort of character when mm. I'm doing stuff outside of time? Right. Uh, so, yeah, I, my, my, my recommendation is to just take a look at your powers first things first. See if those attributes are called out. And if they are, maybe consider throwing some points into it. You don't have to. Okay. Um, and then uh, and then, you know, beyond that, just thinking, do I want to be strong? Do I want to be fast? Do I want to be practiced? Yeah. All right. So, yeah, I'm looking at my uh, Sanguine's powers. Mm. Um, and there is a lot that, uh, for the Sanguine especially, is is dealing with, you know, pulling life force and uh, moving health and, and harm around and all that sort of stuff. You just have the word blood a lot. Yeah, you're a weird blood bender, essentially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so, yeah, so I, I see. Okay, so here's the transfer health equal to your sun. Mm-hmm. Deal harm equal to your shade. Deal harm equal to your moon, uh, depending on the power that I've got in there. Oh, that's interesting. So, you know, you have access to all four of those powers at all times in combat. And so you look at them and you think, like, which one am I going to be using more or which one really calls to me a lot and mm. you know if so i'm gonna put you know if, if it's the one that's linked to shade like maybe i'll put one or two points into shade so that since i know i'm gonna be relying on that button a lot pushing that power i'm gonna be real effective with it yeah what is the blood effect like it says blood effect on here yeah so for sanguine um, sanguine's passive is uh that if you spend one of your health uh when using a power uh, you get to activate the blood effect. So it is the amplified version of that power. So like transfusion only usually allows you to move one health between things. But if you act, you spend a little bit of your own blood, uh, you can move uh, some amount of health. And if you've got four points in sun, you're moving four health around. So you're very good at healing or or, or just putting blood oh. in one person and taking it from another. This is delicious. I love this. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, delicious i'm all talking right. about all this uh, blood <laughs> <I'm> all right <laughs> oh it makes me want to have four in all of them yep <laughs> and you know each each spark you'll you know will eventually get to this part where you're choosing mods there you'll have opportunities to add to your your attributes so for example sanguine can eventually get plus one to sun moon and shade so you know that you'll be able to boost boost them a little bit but yeah a big part of it is just thinking what's what's the thing that really calls to me right now in this moment that's amazing like the siphon ability deals one harm to an enemy and you gain one health but if you spend a health it affects all close enemies Mm -hmm. you just jump into a pile and exactly just have fun yeah and then the the turn before that you you jump into that uh, pile of enemies by turning into a swarm of bats (laughs) that flies into a group of enemies and then you steal all their health (laughs) Uh uh-huh oh it's so good um sanguine's uh supernova they they turn into a, a steel coffin and then they uh they resurrect by appearing nearby somebody and then immediately activating that siphon power that you mentioned so you come back and just start stealing health right away you're like give me my blood back yeah uh-huh <laughs> i think i because nine don't really key off of anything in particular so i just figured i would start by deciding on like how i personally feel like i want to do things yeah. so i just i i have my sun is two, my moon is two, and my shade is three. Cool, including those like initial three. Yeah, and a quick a quick cheat to see if you've if you've got it is if the sum of your attributes equals seven, you've done it. Uh, and this has been a, <laughs> it's been a helpful uh, trick that I use. I had to think about it too. I was like, okay, if it was one, and then a one, and then one and two is four. Right. <laughs> like it shouldn't have been mm. that hard. It does. You're right. Only go up to seven, and nope. Still sometimes, really sometimes, sometimes we just need that quick <laughs> trick. My my pox, I imagine them as not particularly a uh, very strong individual. So they just have the one in sun. 
And I just put, I split my other points between Moon and Shade. So they're kind of a, they can be quick on their feet if they need to be, but also um, very practical and slow, which uh, like a slow methodical, but also fast acting, fast acting thing feels very on brand for uh, a virus themed uh, I like class. It. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think that's what I'm going to go with. Yeah, I went. I went uh, three sun, two moon, two shade, because uh, that that three sun really helps uh, my my transfusion mm. ability. So I I can kind of see myself a little bit as a macabre healer <laughs> of the group. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I love. Which that. sounds amazing. Call to action. Yeah, like that. Oh, this game is just so good. Almost everyone that hears about this game seems to get inspired to actually create a power fantasy game of their own for a different genre, myself included. Uh, One guess what genre I went with. But before we let you go for the week, just a couple calls to action and Patreon shout outs. First up, If you haven't checked out our Patreon lately, we've got some really cool things on there. Our latest offering is a video recording of our broken actual play that Amelia and I were able to do in person. Broken is of course the uh, two player tragic romance RPG by Ben Wallace that we covered in a spotlight episode not too long ago. It was really a fantastic time And we had a lot of fun with it, and it really proved out how well my new studio was with recording for a couple of people. So really, I I think Amelia and I are going to try this again uh, as soon as we are able to, because uh, there's a lot of good games that we could probably play together. Coming up soon, we have a few more pieces of bonus content, uh, which I'm really excited about. Um, all available at the side quest level and higher uh, that I think you'll all really enjoy. You can find out what is all offered by going to patreon.com slash character creation cast. And speaking of Patreon perks, one of those perks is us personally thanking you every episode until this list gets big enough and we have to split it up between episodes. So without further ado, flying solo here, thanking everybody. Thank you to our first patron, Lieutenant, for your continued support. Eric Bonds, thank you as well for your support. David, a.k.a. Tigranosaurus, thank you. Matt Newton, thank you as well. Daryl Holiday II, thank you for your support and all the great comments on our Patreon posts. We really appreciate those. Shadim Cabal, thank you. Caleb, a.k.a. the shyest barbarian, thank you so very much for your support. Benjamin Sweeney, thank you as well. Lorcan McGinnis, thank you so much. Rob Fletcher, thank you. And Kevin Brown, thank you so very much. And thank you to all of our future patrons. We wouldn't be able to make this show as easily without your assistance. And we really, truly appreciate your generosity. That's all we have for today. Tune in next week where we finish our phenomenal character creation for this game with Spencer. It was so very good. Until then, take care of yourselves. Stay safe. Drink some water. Treat yourself to something nice. Don't forget to breathe. And keep making those amazing people. We'll see you next time. Thank you for joining us for part one of this character creation series. We'll be back in part two, picking up right where we left off. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts, this show, and even our press kit. Character Creation Cast can also be found on Twitter at CreationCast. 
or on our Discord server at discord.charactercreationcast.com. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Bolter, and I can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune or online at lordneptune.com. Our other host, Amelia Antrim, can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permissions from the podcast they originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero, remixed by Steve Combs, and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Ryan Bolter. Further information for the game systems used in today's guest can also be found in the show notes. If you'd like to support our show, find us on Patreon. Get access to bonus episodes, extra outtakes, and much more at patreon.com slash character creation cast. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find the best part of any role playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We'll see you next time. Read some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit OneShotPodcast.com where you will find other great shows like System Mastery. System Mastery is a delightful stroll through the history of role playing games, except the games are terrible and the hosts are real jerks about everything. Join hosts Jeff and John as they explore the weirdest games ever made to talk about what worked, what went wrong, and which Silverhawk was the best. It was Hot Wing. Don't even add us. Find their show at systemmasterypodcast.com or oneshotpodcast.com.